face to face I found my pain Beneath the lies and broken dreams Lost the love I had in me It tore me apart, fade away I felt so lost but I held on to what I had For what it's worth that you It's Stacy. I'm back. I was kind of leery there for a little while, but I am back. And um, I believe I owe that to each and every one of you who prayed for me during the past week. It was very scary, but I wanted to do a live stream and come on and thank y'all all for the outpour of love. Um, I was so amazed by how many people reached out to me to tell me that they were praying, that they loved me, their thoughts were with me. It was just overwhelming. I was going to do a live stream to thank y'all, but I don't think I'm to the point where I can sit up that long yet. So I figured maybe it would be easier for me to do a video and probably less emotional for me because it was a very emotional time. Um, so I figured I might could control some of the tears, but um, you know, a video I can stop and take breaks as I need to and then come back and work on it some more where a live stream, I just have to sit up and with the incisions and all, it does still hurt a little bit, so, but I'm doing so much better. I wanted to come on and explain to y'all what exactly happened and um, how my life took a total change that night. So, anyway, my granddaughter had came down and stayed a couple of weeks with me and Cliff. She does every summer and my daughter had brought her down and it was Friday night we were supposed to take her back and so um, we ended up heading back up to North Carolina but the shocking thing was it was supposed to be just me and um, I was gonna take her, Cliff was gonna stay here, and I was just gonna run up there Friday night, spend the night with them Friday, and turn around and come back Saturday. And I had plans to go down to Patty's on Tuesday. So I was going down there, and I was gonna film with Patty and Heather and Clay, and possibly meet Christina for the first time, and. Christy York was supposed to be coming into town, so we were all going to get together and go to some places. Well, anyway, Friday morning, Cliff called, and he told me that he had talked to his boss and that he was going to get off work a couple of hours early and that he was going to go with me to take Renee home, which I was excited. I was glad, but I didn't know how important that would play out till later. So we ended up waiting around for him and we were taking my car. And when we got in the car to leave, I told Cliff I would drive. And we went down the road to the gas station, which isn't even half a mile. And when I came out of the gas station, I just didn't feel good. And I hadn't felt good the night before. I just, my stomach had felt really weird, but I didn't know what was going on. It wasn't enough to say I was sick. It just wasn't normal. So when I come out of the gas station, I told Cliff, I said, you want to drive? And he looked at me and started laughing. He said, you going to let me drive your hot ride? 
And I told him miracles never ceased, and we laughed about it. But I told him, I said, I just don't feel real good. I said, I'd, I'd rather you drive if you don't mind. He said, that was fine. So on the way up there, 95 was, I-95, Interstate 95, was very backed up. And um, Cliff decided he would go down a back road that would go around some of the bigger towns that we would have to go through. I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. But he would take the back road to save us some travel time because it was already going to be later when we got into town that night. And um, so we got off on a back road and I kept feeling worse, but I felt like it was my sugar. Now, for those of you who don't know, I am not a diabetic. I'm hypoglycemic, so my sugar does tend to drop really low at times. And normally, I have what are called glucose tablets with me. And it's weird because we always have a little container in the car, in the truck. I carry one in my backpack with my film and stuff. I carry one in my purse. So there should have been three at least of these containers right where I could get my hands on them. And I told Cliff, I said, I think my sugar is dropping. And gonna yell at my dog, Addy. So, anyway, he pulled over to the side of the road and we dug through everything. We went through the car, we were out there digging through the trunk. I started getting really sick and I told him, I said, I'm fixing to pass out. I said, I need to go sit down. So he continued going through my filming stuff and the car looking, but we couldn't find any of the tablets. And I guess maybe I took them and didn't realize. I don't really, still don't know what happened with that. So he's like, we got to make it to, a, you know, a town and we're in the middle of nowhere. So we had drove about I'd say about 20 miles and I was to the point where I really was about to pass out when he saw a Dollar General. Dollar Generals are everywhere. But unfortunately, Dollar Generals do not sell glucose tablets. But he did go in and he spoke to the girl that worked there and she said, well, what about something with sweets, you know, sugar? So he bought a pecan roll or a pecan, one of those logs, and um, a cherry Coke. And he brought it out to me. I took two bites of the pecan log and immediately my sugar started doing better. So I started feeling, you know, all right. But because all of this had happened, we had got further behind and now it was gonna be like 10, 30, 11 o'clock when we ended up getting into Statesville, which is outside of Charlotte and close to where my middle daughter lives. And we had a motel room for the night because my daughter's a nurse and my son-in-law um, is a truck driver and they both had places, they had to be at work the next morning. So we got us a motel room and just told them that Renee could stay with us at the room and that we would see them the next night. We were going to change our plans and stay for the whole weekend and when we got into town we hadn't ate supper yet so we went through Taco Bell I got me a taco salad and we took it back to the room Renee was really excited because Descendants 3 was going to be on Disney Friday night for the first time so we told her we'd get the food go back to the room and she could watch Descendants 3 I ate my taco salad and within 30 minutes I was sick. Felt like what started off as really bad 
indigestion or gas. And Cliff got up and got me some Tums. I took three the first time and it didn't do anything. And it started hurting worse. So I grabbed some more. I took some more of them. Nothing. But my back, like around my back in my rib cage, felt almost like a vice grip was on it, just squeezing tighter and tighter. And I told Cliff, I said, can you rub my back? I said, it's, it's really hurting. And I was laying in the bed at this time and he went to rub my back and as soon as he started the pain intensified by 100%. Now, I have to tell y'all, I've had seven different surgeries. I've given childbirth. I've had my gallbladder removed. I had gangrene actually settle into my gallbladder. It was so bad. I have never hurt the way I hurt that night. I got up, I was feeling very nauseated and I had felt this way before, not to this extent, but I had felt this way before. And a lot of times when I had felt this way, if I drank milk, it helped. So Cliff asked me if I wanted him to go get me some milk. And I told him, please, I said, please just hurry. I was laying in the floor, I'm crying. He ran down to the motel lobby and he told Renee to watch over me while he was gone. I remember her coming in, and Renee is my 11-year-old granddaughter. I remember her coming in, and she wiped my head with a wet washcloth. And she asked me if I was okay. It was the saddest thing because she was crying and she was like, Nana, are you going to be okay? And I, I was trying to fake it because I didn't want her to worry. And she is also the granddaughter who lost her brother. My grandsons that you hear me talk about that a lot of my older subscribers know that I had lost. Her brother is one of my grandsons that I had lost. So she's very familiar with death. I'm sorry. Okay, I got it together. And I just realized how rough I look. I'm sorry y'all are having to look at me all scary looking. <laughs> anyway, um... Cliff came back with the milk and I tried to drink some of that and it was really weird to me because I was nauseated and I was dry heaving but nothing was coming up which didn't make sense because I had just ate that Taco Bell salad and I was wanting to get it off my stomach in case that was part of the problem. And then I had drank the milk, but none of that was coming back up. So I, I didn't understand why I couldn't get rid of it. I know this is gross, but I, I just couldn't understand why I wasn't throwing it back up. And um, when Cliff came back in, he's like, started getting really worried at this point because I was in so much pain. The clothes that I had on and my hair was sopping wet. Cliff said, Stacy, it looks like you just stepped in the shower with your clothes on. He's trying to wipe my head and help me and He's asking me if I want to get back to the bed. I, I couldn't move. I'm like, just leave me here. I'm laying on the bathroom floor and he brought me a pillow and I kept passing out in and out of consciousness. 
and finally he got me woke up he was wiping my head again and he called 911 and he said they should be on their way the next thing I remember was I thought it was the EMTs, but it was the fire department that got there first. And they started asking me, you know, my name, what was going on, um, date of birth, and it hurt so bad to talk. And I understood that they were trying to see if, like, I was coherent so I, I tried to answer them the best I could, but again, I kept passing out. So the EMTs finally got there and um, they started asking the same things. And I couldn't talk loud enough for them to hear me. So they kept saying, you gotta speak louder, we can't hear you. and. I was thinking, y'all don't realize how bad this hurts for me to breathe air in and it put any pressure on my organs. Of course, I wasn't telling them that. I was just trying to answer them. Well, because I was in the bathroom, they couldn't get the stretcher in. So they, and to top it off, we were on the second floor of the hotel with no elevator, only stairs. So they needed me to pull myself up and get in this new chair contraption that I found out I was the very first patient they had ever used it on. And I used every bit of energy and strength I had at that point with their help to pull me up off the floor and to get in that chair. There's no headrest. It just stopped right behind your shoulder blades. And I couldn't hold my head up. And I kept trying to lean over on something, but there was nothing there. So I just let my head fall. Well, bless their hearts. I think that I must have gotten the two scrawniest EMTs there ever was out there. Because trying to get me and that chair down to the bottom floor, they didn't know how to work the chair. It was jerking. They didn't get me locked in all the way. The back popped out. Every one of these jolts was miserable. And I said to one of them, I said, isn't there any way we can do this? Any other way we can do this? And he said, you can walk. No, 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 no. That did not play with Stacy at that time. And I turned around and I said, you don't have to be a rude ass. He said, excuse me? I said, you heard me. I said, God forbid you ever hurt like this and have somebody like you coming to take you to the hospital. Oh, y'all, I was so mad. He said, ma'am, I'm not trying to be rude, but that's the only choices. It's either you walk or we carry you down. Granted, he probably was fed up because he couldn't work the chair. He's having to tote me down the steps, and he was the bigger of the two boys who probably weighed maybe, he probably weighed 140 pounds soaking wet. So these guys were tiny guys. I'm used to Cliff, okay? Six foot four, 250 pounds. Cliff can throw me over his shoulder. So I'm sitting there thinking, just give me to my husband and let him take me. It would have been so much easier. But anyway, I get in the back of the ambulance and I ask him, I said, can I please have something for pain? He says, I can't give you anything until we rule out that it's not your heart. He said, um, we gotta make sure you're not having a heart attack. Well, 
I understood that I was hurting so bad. But I thought, okay, it had at this point eased off a little bit. It still was hurting, but I felt like it was more manageable this, at this point. So we get to the hospital and they start running tests. They do EKGs, they do CAT scans, they do all kinds of stuff. And they finally gave me morphine after they did the EKG and the EKG come back okay. So at this point, I'm exhausted. I had just been fighting it for so long, I was just exhausted. And I fell asleep and I woke up to the doctor coming in the room. Cliff and Renee were not in there. I wasn't sure. They had followed us, followed the ambulance to the hospital. They had been in my room, but at that point when I woke up, they were not in there. I didn't know Cliff had taken Renee to the restroom, but I didn't know that. And the doctor come in and woke me up and she said, we have a problem. I was like, okay. And she said, your stomach and your intestines have flipped. You have a hernia that is your intestines have poked through where they have flipped over. The way she explained it was if my intestines flipped like and made a circle, then more of my intestines and my stomach had came through and it was all cutting off the blood supply to my digestive tract. She said, it's a race against time and if we don't get you, she said, it's, it's out of my scope and if I don't get you to a trauma center, you will die. As she said it to me, in walks Renee and Cliff and Renee's little mouth just dropped. So again, that broke my heart. And I don't blame the doctor because she didn't know they were gonna walk in at this time. You couldn't see because there was curtains, so she had no way of knowing. But Renee's mouth dropped and she started to cry. I looked at Cliff and his eyes were wide open in his mouth and I probably wouldn't have worded it that way to him. If she had just told me and I could have related, I would have probably been a little bit more secretive about how bad it was just because I love them and I didn't want to worry them. So, as she's telling me this, and of course, Cliff's starting to ask questions, the EMTs come back into the room. She'd already called them for transporting me. And I didn't even remember what they looked like at that point. I didn't know if it was the same ones or not, to be honest. And Cliff made the comment, oh, it's y'all again. And I said, oh, are y'all the ones that brought me here? And the one guy caught a rude ass, said, yes, ma'am, it was us. I said, I need to apologize. And he started laughing. He said, honey, it's okay. I've been called a lot worse than a rude ass before. And so we kind of laughed and he, we got along a lot better the second time, needless to say. Um, the only other problem I really had with that was, and I guess it has to do with the whole opiate crisis going on in the United States, but it had been 
an hour since they had gave me the morphine by the time we got ready to go. And apparently they didn't give me a whole lot of morphine when they did give it to me. So the nurse told the EMTs that she was gonna, she was supposed to give me fentanyl for the pain, but she, I don't know, she was saying, no wait, she was supposed to give me morphine for the pain, but she said they had fentanyl on the ambulances, which would be better for me. And she asked the CMT if he would give me fentanyl once he got me hooked up and back in the ambulance, to which he responded, yes. And nobody ever gave me any pain medicine. So as they transported me back over to Winston-Salem to Wake Forest Hospital, which I guess is about 40 to 45 minutes, the morphine had wore off. I was hurting again. And um, he didn't want to give me any medicine. He told me that the way they are watched, that if he doesn't have it from a doctor, which I wish he had told the nurse that, but he didn't want to give it to me. So I started hurting again pretty bad about halfway through that trip from the first hospital to the trauma center where they were taking me. I feel like I'm leaving so much out and I, I don't want to make it some long drawn out story but there's so many details and so much that y'all need to know to see why things kind of went the way they did. Okay, sorry, I had to get up and go sit in my recliner for a little bit. But, um, anyway, we were on the ambulance ride to the trauma center. I remember the EMT told me, I guess he was talking to me, trying to keep my mind off of everything, and he was talking to me, and he goes, well, you're racking up the bill on this trip, huh? Because he had asked me where I was from. I said, Georgia. He said, Georgia, ain't nothing wrong with that. And we kind of were talking. And he said, well, this little weekend trip, you're racking up a lot of money on it. And I was hurting so bad, y'all. I just busted out crying. And I said, I know, and I can't even fix my camera. And he didn't know why I was talking about a camera. He had no clue that I was on YouTube. And he starts patting me. He's like, oh, honey, you'll get your camera fixed. It's okay. He said, you got good insurance. It'll cover it. Don't worry about that. So looking back now, that was kind of funny to me. But at the time, I was just so broke up and depressed and just awful about it. But um, we finally got to the trauma center at Wake Forest. And... I have to tell y'all this because this was so weird. We're parked and I'm laying in the ambulance looking out the, black, the back two panels of windows on the ambulance door. And from where I was at, I could see the fourth story of the parking garage. And y'all, there was a girl standing on the ledge she had long brown hair, about the color of mine, about the length of mine. She had on a hospital gown that was tied at her neck, but it bellowed out in the wind, almost like it wasn't tied around her back. And her hair and that gown was just blowing. And there was a light that was behind her that you could see the silhouette of her body and it scared me and I told the EMT 
I said, there's a girl on the fourth story of the parking garage. Well, at that time, he jumped up to look out and it blocked my view. And apparently, bless her heart, she must have jumped at the point he went to get up because he couldn't see her. I think he thought I had hallucinated or just been seeing things because he was like, hmm, how you feeling? Are you okay? And I'm like, that was weird. And he's like, well, you're fixing to be in the hospital. They're going to take care of you. So as they unloaded us in the bay and took me into the hospital, this trauma hospital was crazy. As soon as I got into the doors, I'm laying on the stretcher. There are stretchers lined all the way down the hall. There was a nurse that came out. I remember his name was David and he was very, very nice and knew how to do his job. But he remind, reminded me of Mama of Code, Code Black, if you've ever seen that TV show. He was pointing and telling them all where to go and he said, is this my dead gut girl? And the EMT said, yeah. And he said, I need her in room 18. Well, one of the other nurses said, room 18's got somebody in it. He said, look, I got two DOAs over here off a drug overdose that they just got threw out at the door. He said, I've got a jumper off the fourth um, floor of the parking garage, and I've got a dead gut girl. Get her in room 18. Well, when he said that, me and the EMT glanced at each other because at this time I knew and he knew that I had seen what I thought I saw. Not only did that really upset me, but right across from me was the two DOA drug overdoses. They looked to be late teens, early 20s. And there was a boy and a girl. They used, it's called Narcan, I believe. And what the EMT said is as soon as they do, they hit you with it, I guess they, a needle and they inject it into you or whatever they have to do. It clears out every drug, every bit of alcohol that's in your system and you wake up in immense pain and um, they did that to the boy and he comes sitting straight up on the bed and then fell back and the EMT said well that's good it worked on him but then they tried it on the girl and there was no response and he said that one's not good so I'm sitting there in my mind I've always heard death comes in threes and there was the young girl who had jumped that they didn't think they were going to be able to save there was the two kids overdosed one they saved and one they didn't think they were going to be able to save so that was two of them they were looking at dying and it just hit me that I was gonna be number three. Okay guys, so anyway, as soon as they got me into the room, it wasn't long after that until they took me up to surgery. At some point, I had spoken to my oldest daughter who was, who was a surgical tech. And I don't really remember when this happened because I just remember 
her asking me if they had said anything about putting in a whiffle. And I remembered her telling me about this before, but I had forgot until she brought it up. And I was like, no. And she said, well, that's when they have to do a surgery and basically you're on a liquid diet for the rest of your life. And I was like, well, they haven't, you know, said anything about that. So a little while passes and they take me up to the surgery to get me prepped for everything. And um, the doctors bring out the piece of paper that you have to sign saying you give them permission to operate. And the paper that they had basically said to do exploratory surgery, surgery I'm sorry, I can't talk, <coughs> to do exploratory surgery, to untwist my stomach and bowels, to fix the hernia, I think that was it on that one. So I signed the paper and a few minutes later they come back and they said that they had forgot to include a few things. And when I read the rest of the things they had put on there, it included a coloscopy bag a feeding tube, some other type of tube that runs from the inside out where you drain it every day to get the acids off your stomach. I can't remember what that one was called. And a whiffle. And fear shot through me. And just as soon as that fear went through me, all of a sudden, a calmness settled back over me. And I guess maybe the doctors are used to people being pretty scared and nervous, upset about being told that type of things. But the doctor asked me, he said, are you okay? And I looked at him, I said, yes. He said, are you sure? Do you need to talk to somebody about this before we do this? I said, no. I said, I have such an overwhelming feeling of peace right now. I said, it's almost like God just spoke to me and told me that no matter what happens in that operating room, He will be with me. And I told the doctor, I said, if it's his will, there's a point to it. If it's his will that he wants me to have a coloscopy bag or feed him to this other tube or a whiffle, some reason he wants me to have it. And if I have him, then I have everything I need so I can get through it. And the doctor looked at me and it was so, it wasn't funny at the time, but it was funny now. He had tears in his eyes. He said, I respect that so much. So anyway, guys, I did. I had, a, I really, I really felt like whatever I had to go through, I had to go through. But it was better than leaving behind my husband, my parents, my children, and my grandchildren. Our families faced enough death. And I remember, I remember me and Patty talking one night. Patty took out a picture, it's like 10 people in this picture. And she was telling me that these were all her really good friends. But every body. Sorry. 
everybody in the picture except for Patty was gone now. They had all passed away. Gary and Mike were in it. Some of her girlfriends that she was very close to. And I remember thinking she can't handle another death either. So as long as I'm alive, I can handle those tubes. I can handle whatever gets thrown at me as long as I have my life. See, I wouldn't make it on live stream. <laughs> but anyway, surgery went really good. And when I woke up, I was in my room and I was surrounded by people who love me the most, my husband. My youngest daughter had come up from Georgia. My oldest daughter, well, my youngest daughter and my year old granddaughter had come from Georgia. My oldest daughter, her husband and their two kids had came down from Virginia. My middle daughter was at work, but that's whose house we were at, so she was coming later. Her husband was on the way up. He was letting Renee get some sleep because she'd been up all night with us. And um, I started feeling all over my stomach because I'm like, where's these tubes? Where are these tubes? Where is this bag? And there was nothing. And I can't remember if it was Cliff or the nurse that I said, where's everything at? And they started laughing. They said, Stacy, you didn't need anything. All they had to do was flip it back around, put it all back into its original position, hold the breath for a few minutes, and the blood flow started flowing back like no problem. Doctors had already told me they had seen where the tissue was starting. It hadn't died, but it was, I guess, turning white because of the absence of blood. And now it, it was back to pink and everything was looking the way it was supposed to look. And they all kept commenting that I was a miracle. They had never seen somebody so messed up that completely turned around, did 360 and come back to being in that good a shape. It wasn't later until I really found out how big of a miracle I was. grabbed my phone a few hours well it, it was probably during the night I guess Saturday night or Sunday morning before I got it but um, I saw a message from Lou Rock saying we love you we had over 50% of the United States praying for you I looked at my messages. There was over 3,000 personal messages, meaning through Facebook Messenger, um, Twitter, Instagram, personally to me saying, you know, Stacy, I'm praying for you. That's not including all the ones that had put me in just like a regular post. You know, it was, I, I'm not counting the ones that had praying for Stacy or Stacy's in surgery, please pray. That's not counting those. I could not believe how many of y'all were praying for me. And that is why I believe that I woke up without a tube, 
without a colonoscopy bag, without a whiffle, without anything. It's because of all of you who at that point turned to God and asked Him to be with me. Nobody will ever convince me to believe anything else because there's that many people just on social media not including own personal family prayer request you know people in my own personal life people that's reached out to me you know like my oldest daughter's husband's grandma has me on a prayer list so many people and I can never thank y'all enough that is why I wanted to tell y'all how bad the situation really truly was so that y'all understand the miracle that y'all helped create pretty impressed and I thank every one of y'all for it I found out later just how hard it was on my family when my girls say they heard their daddy's voice break or crack for the first time ever in their lives or when my granddaughter tells me that she was in the corner, balled up, hiding, and crying because she was scared. When I hear Patty tell me how upset she was, but when other people spoke to Patty and witnessed how upset she was, when my best friend from home tells me how upset she was when my sisters are calling my brother when my nieces say I love you I realize just how many people would have been affected and because of y'all I'm fine just gotta heal up some stitches and I'll be as good as new So I really do owe y'all a lot. Now, I can't drive for six weeks. Well, five weeks now. And I can't lift over anything over the weight limit of a milk, gallon of milk. So, I still haven't got my camera fixed. But, gonna work on that. And I may just have to do some videos like this I'm also thinking about doing maybe some top tens of the scariest videos or shocking captures things like that y'all let me know in the comments if y'all would like to see that and um, if y'all have any ideas for anything that I could do that wouldn't require a lot of traveling or walk in anything like that for the next few weeks shoot them out to me and give me some ideas because I'm already going crazy not filming so I'd like to be able to do something give myself something to do just sitting here it's kind of crazy I can't babysit my granddaughter right now because I can't lift her so um, it's boring Anyway, guys, I hope y'all like this video. I hope y'all like me telling y'all, you know, the real story. Basically, behind the night, God saved my life. Y'all saved my life. Y'all went to him, and he did something. So, um, thank you for that. I love all of you. Got some new merch out there if you want to look at it my daughter helped me yesterday set up some new stuff we got delete we deleted all that messed up stuff because teespring was supposed to straighten it out 
and they never figured out how to do it, I guess. I messed stuff up, I messed it up good, so we took that off and put some new stuff out, and um, that link will be in the description, and um, yeah, so anyway, love you guys, miss all of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love each and every one of you, and until the next road trip, love you, bye. Face to face I found my pain Beneath the lies and broken dreams Lost the love I had in me It tore me apart, fade away I felt so lost but I held on to what I had For what it's worth that you build and know Just know that you can, yes you you hold. Rise above and let it glow. Just know that it's never too late to make a change. Crash and burn, I found myself.